Uh, in this lesson, we're gonna solve this node voltage problem. It's a little more complicated than the last one we did, but it's not so complicated to bog you down too much. Um, essentially, we have a current source here. We're given the full-blown current source as a function of time in amps. We have a current source up here, again, given the full-blown current in amps. And then we have a capacitor inductor resistance, but the values of the capacitance and the inductance is given in terms of their units. Uh, so we have to calculate the impedance. And what we're asked to do, we're, we're given a voltage here at this node and a voltage here right at this connection, and we're asked to find these voltages as functions of time. So the th same thing's gonna happen as we did in the last problem. We're going to write our sources down as phasors. We're going to calculate the impedances of these components. So we have a new circuit that will involve the impedances and the phasor representation of everything. And then we'll write our node voltage equation, which will be a little bit more complicated because there'll actually be two node voltage equations. Because notice we have a node up here and we have a node over here. Um, and then we'll have to solve that system of equations to find V1 and V2, and when we get that, which will be phasor versions of that, then we'll go back to the time domain. Uh, so it's a, a few more steps, but it, you'll see it's not too hard. The one thing I need you to realize is when you get over to this node, this is drawn like this on purpose to confuse you. You see this kind of thing a lot on exams. It looks like there's a node here and a node here. So some students will start trying to write a node equation here and then a separate node equation here, but you need to think about it. Even though they're separated on the paper here, if you physically built the circuit, this wire would physically be connected straight into here because this is just a short circuit, it's just a wire. There's no resistance here. So this connection point, even though it's drawn here, you can mentally draw it right on top of here. So really, this is a single node here, and this is a single node here. And that makes thinking about it a lot simpler. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is write our phasers down, okay? Uh, so here we have IA, so I'll do capital IA. What's the phasor representation of that? The magnitude is five, it's a cosine, so we can just write the phase angle in directly 30 degrees. The frequency being 10 radians per second, we just remember that for later on down the line. So that is the value of that. And then we have, and I'll save a little space here and put it the amp right there. And then we have IB, which is uh, written at the top of the board. The magnitude of that guy is three. Again, it's a cosine, so we can just drop the phase angle directly in of 60 degrees like this. So these are the phasers that we're going to use when we write this stuff down. Now we need to calculate the impedances of the other components so that we can continue. So let's write the impedance of the capacitor is one over J omega C, which is one over J omega, is given implicit in this. It's the number right in front of the time, so it's 10 radians per second. And the capacitance, look at that, it's one tenth, so that makes the math very simple. So essentially what you're gonna have is, this is gonna give you one, so you have one over J, and, and again, anytime you have J in the denominator, you can move it upstairs and make it negative. So that's negative J ohms. So the capacitance is negative as it should be for an impedance, and it's negative J ohms. And that's what we have for the capacitance. All right. Now actually, there's two capacitors here, so I'm gonna label this C1. Let's go ahead and calculate the capacitance of capacitor number two. So again, it's one over J omega C, so J omega is 10, C is one over 20. So 10 over 20 is gonna give you one half. So what you'll have is one over J, one half, right? One divided one half is gonna give you two. And the J, when you move it upstairs, is gonna give you negative J. So negative J two ohms. So that is the uh, impedance associated with that. And then the inductance is going to give you J omega L. So it's J times 10 times one over 10. So these give you one and you're just left with J, J ohms. At the end of the day, your impedances should be negative for your capacitances and they should be positive for your inductances. So at least that makes sense. So we have all of that in place. Um, and I guess we could make it even clearer. We can just kind of write this stuff on the board. Let's go ahead and do it in green. So the phasor version of this is five at an angle of 30 degrees. The impedance associated with this guy is negative J ohms. The impedance of this guy is positive J ohms. The impedance of this guy is this one, negative J2 ohms. And the phasor value of this guy is three at an angle of 60 degrees. Because we're gonna write our, our, our uh, node voltage equation in a second and we wanna just have everything in place. Now as far as what are we gonna use for our reference node? Well this is, 
This is a node that we care about. This is a node, as we said, it's kind of one node together. And this is just all connected together. So as in most of these problems, the reference that we're going to use is basically going to be the bottom of the circuit. That's almost always going to be the case. So let's write a node voltage equation at V1 or at position 1 over there. So I'll kind of write it like this. So what would that look like? Basically, we're trying to track the currents coming in and out of this node, but we're writing it in terms of this node voltage V1. So this is current flowing into the node, so that makes it negative. So it's going to be negative 5 at an angle of 30 degrees. That's current flowing into that node. And then we have current up here also flowing into this node, 3 at an angle of 60. That's also negative because it's flowing into that node. Now we have the current flowing away from the node through this capacitance. So it's the voltage across the capacitor divided by its impedance. We call that positive because we're assuming the current's coming out. So it's going to be V1 over uh, negative J. That's the impedance. Right? Just like that. And then we have the voltage, or I'm sorry, the current flowing through this resistor away like this. So it's V1 minus V2. Notice the V2, we've labeled it here, but really we mentally know that it's really the same voltage here. So it's V1 minus V2 that gives us this voltage drop over 2. So it's going to be V1 minus V2 over 2. And that's everything because we only have four branches coming out of here and we've tracked all the currents in each of them and we've written a, a valid node voltage equation uh, here. Now this node voltage equation involves V1 and V2. Okay, so we're going to simplify this equation. Then we're going to write another node voltage equation at the other node, which will also involve V1 and V2. Two equations, two unknowns, then we can solve it. All right, so let me switch colors here, make it a little bit simpler. When we take this in your calculator and subtract off this, you're going to get 7.745 at an angle of negative 138.83 degrees. Okay, this is this, when you subtract these phasors together. This guy, you can move this negative J upstairs and make him positive J V1. This guy is a subtraction and it's all over the same denominator, so we can split it up. So V1 over 2 is going to be 0.5 V1. And then minus sign comes from there. Then we, again we have 0.5 V2 is equal to 0. All we did was split this fraction up because ultimately we want to combine like terms together. Okay which is actually what we're going to do right now. So let's take this, forget about this for a second, let's work with the V1s here. Here we have the V1 terms, the real and imaginary parts, so we can factor out V1, we can say 0.5, that's the real part, plus J, V1. All I did was factor out the V1, the real part is here, the imaginary part is right there. And then we have the V2 part, negative 0.5 V2, that's everything there. This is just a number, a complex number. We can move it to the other side of the equal sign. Now when you do that, like if you take this in your calculator, you have to be a little careful and multiply by negative 1. Uh, if you put this polar representation and multiply by negative 1, you're going to get 7.745 at an angle. The angle is not going to be this. The angle is going to be actually something else, 41.17 degrees. This is what it becomes once you move it to the other side by multiplying by negative 1. Um, I always advocate using a calculator when dealing with phasors. You know, sometimes you think, oh, I just multiply by negative 1, and then it's just going to be a negative number here, over here. But really, it's better just to do it in your calculator to avoid mistakes, because what's really happening here is this phasor representation, this is in polar form, but really, you could change it into rectangular form, real plus imaginary part, right? And so when you take a real plus imaginary part and you multiply by negative 1, then both parts of that complex number, the real in the imaginary part. They both get negated. So it's like if you look at the coordinate plane there, if, if the thing was pointed this way and you negate the real and imaginary part, now it's suddenly pointed in the other direction, catty corner to where it was. In other words, it's shifted by 180 degrees in the complex plane because you multiply the real and imaginary part and you negate both parts of it. So when you do that, you generally shift by 180. So the original angle was one third, negative 138. You shift by 180. That's why it becomes the 41 degrees. Because in the complex plane, you're shifting it. You're adding 180 degrees to this, essentially, is what you're doing. Now, instead of remembering all those little rules, just stick it in your calculator and hit negative 1. I mean, if you can remember the rules, great. But if you get a phase angle wrong, eventually, you're just going to get the whole system of equations wrong, and then you'll be crying. So this is. Um, I'm going to put an asterisk by it. It's one of our equations. V1 and V2 are on the left-hand side. We have a number, a complex number, on the right-hand side. Now let's write some node voltage equation at position 2 right here. So 
to track the current coming out in this direction, it'll be V2 minus V1 over 2. So V2 minus V1 over 2, okay? And then, let me see which direction I wanted to go next to make sure everything's consistent. Let's track it through the inductor. It'll be the voltage V2 divided by the impedance here, J. So it'll be V2 over J. And then next, it'll be the, the current going through here, V2 over negative J2, negative J2. And then finally, you have the current coming out of here. This, in this case, the current's flowing away from the node, so it's positive 3 angle 60 degrees is equal to 0. Okay? So we have V2 minus V1 over 2, V2 over J, 3, 3 over 60, and then V2 over negative J2 is equal to 0. Now we want to start... Um, I'm breaking this up and start, you know, it's like a puzzle. You have to break it apart so that you can see the terms and you can combine the terms back together. This fraction needs to be broken apart. So it'll be V2 over 2, 0 0.5 V2 is another way to write that, minus 0 0.5 V1 there. This J can come upstairs making a negative J V2. This ne uh, negative J can come upstairs making it plus J. Um, and then you have let's write it like this, plus 0 0.5 J V2. Okay, the 0.5 comes from the 1 half, this goes upstairs making it positive J, and then this can be moved to the other side. Exactly the same thing happens. If you don't remember the rules, you might get the wrong answer. But basically when you do that, you're shifting it by 180 degrees, so it'll be 3 at an angle of negative 120 uh, there. And if you don't you can't visualize that in a complex plane. Just stick 3 at an angle of 60 and multiply by negative 1. This is what you should get. All right, so now we have a valid equation. Now we want to do is simplify this. Uh, and we're going to look for terms involving V1. The only term we have is this one here. So it's negative 0 0.5 times V1. Now we look for V2. The only real part of V2 is this one. So just to make it simple, this will be 0 0.5 and the imaginary part, here we have the J here, we have 0.5 and negative 1, so it would be negative 0.5 J, and I'll just put the V2 on the outside. Make sure you understand that. Basically, you have the 0.5 V2 here, and then all I did was combine these terms. This is negative 0.5 J V2. So I just did all of that, and I factored out the V2 at the same time. And then on the right-hand side, you'll have the 3 angle negative 120. And this is the second equation that we need for our system of equations because now we have two equations, two unknowns, and you want them written V1, V2, and whatever numbers you have on the right-hand side. So you write it as a matrix, and you will get the following coefficient matrix. The first guy, 0.5 plus J, and then negative 0.5. So 0 0.5 plus J, and then the next term was negative 0 0.5. This guy was negative 0 0.5, and then we have this, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 J, okay? And then what we have, we close this off, then our X matrix is what we're solving for, V1 and V2, and that's gonna be equal to the right-hand side. Now on the first guy, the constant on the right was this, this number, 7.745 angle 41.17. So 7.745 angle, 41.17 degrees. And then this guy is 3 angle, negative 120 degrees here. All right. So we've done enough of this solving system of equations business. I'm not going to you know, write everything down for you. I'm not going to solve and actually make the inverse matrix for you. But basically, you take this matrix, you stick it in your calculator, hit the inverse button, it's going to create an inverse matrix. Then you take that matrix and you multiply by this one, because the answer is going to be basically but multiplying inverse on both sides. It kind of gets rid of this one, and you're left with this equals whatever you have from that multiplication on the right-hand side. It'll be 8.944 angle negative 46.016 degrees, and you'll have 8.532 angle negative 29.567 degrees, and this is volts and volts. So here you have the value of V1 as a phasor, and the value of V2 as a phasor. Now the question actually asked you to write it in terms of functions of time. So for V1, as a function of time, this is the magnitude and the phase angle. So you write it as 8.944 
times the cosine, then you have to come up with the frequency. And you go back to the problem and you say, okay, this was the original source. This was 10 radians per second. That's the frequency. That's going to be the frequency of all of these signals in the circuit. So it's going to be 10 times t, and your phase angle just comes along for the ride. 46, negative 46, 0.016 volts. And it'll be something similar for V2. You'll have the magnitude, 8.532, cosine 10 times t, and you have a negative phase angle, negative 29.56. 7 degrees V. This is what you would circle on your test. Let me just double check it's right. So 8.944 cosine 10 T minus 46.016 degrees. 8.532 cosine 10 T minus 29.567 degrees. That's basically it. Um, this is a very, very good intermediate problem in node voltage because you don't have so many equations where the chance of error goes through the roof, but you definitely have to know what you're doing. You have to know that, hey, I, I got to convert these to phasor source representations. You have to know, hey, I know how to convert these um, values using the frequency into an impedance form. And then you have to know, hey, how do I write node voltage equation there? And hey, how do I write a node voltage equation there? And how do I get everything written in a, in a form that I can go ahead and put it into this matrix representation so that I can inverse this matrix, multiply by this matrix, and get the answers? And what does that mean? How do I transform it back into the time domain? That's the power of phasor analysis, okay? So it's a good intermediate problem in node voltage Comp calculations of phasor problems. Solve it yourself. Make sure you can do it. Follow me on to the next one. We have a few more. We'll get a little more complicated as we go, but really this is the this is the gist of it. Once you can do this, doing the other ones, maybe there'll be an extra equation, maybe there'll be something to think about, but essentially it will be the same thing as what we're doing right here. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.